Today I want to talk about a few things going on in Second Amendment law. So let me first say, when I started practicing law in 1994, my God, I can't believe it's been that long, was a really an open question about what the Second Amendment even meant. Many people like me argued that the Second Amendment, like every other amendment, protected an individual's right to keep and bear arms. But that was not the prevailing opinion, especially here in the Ninth Circuit. Many people argued that the Second Amendment protected some kind of a collective right, or maybe the right of the state to have a National Guard. As crazy as those arguments seem now, and they seemed crazy at the time as well, that was a really serious argument. And the Supreme Court really didn't speak very clearly on the Second Amendment until just recently, in fact, 2008. And that's kind of hard to believe to begin with. But it wasn't until 2008 when we got the Heller decision that the Supreme Court came out with what you might think the earth-shattering pronouncement that the Second Amendment pretty much means what it says. It protects an individual's right to keep and bear arms, at least in the home, okay? Because this was about a Washington, D.C. ordinance that made it very difficult for people to have firearms in the home. Essentially, they said if you have a gun in your home, it has to be inoperable. You really couldn't use it for self-defense. Of course, this was challenged. It went up through the courts, and the Supreme Court did what I believe the right thing, to say, no, there's an individual right to keep and bear arms. And they declared that in the Heller case, so they struck down the Washington, D.C. ordinance. So it was a 5-4 decision. It was written by Justice Scalia. So it was a close call, but Justice Scalia and some of the judges didn't really lay out exactly how lower courts were supposed to analyze Second Amendment issues. If you're familiar with some of my other talks, then you're familiar with some of my thoughts about where we went wrong in the country. In essence, I think in 1937, there were a series of cases, but in essence, the court in those cases did several things. They changed how they did business, and they created what we call now a level of scrutiny analysis. Certain rights, individual rights, were subject to what we now call a strict scrutiny analysis. Uh, states or the federal government, if they were going to interfere with an individual's right here. They needed to show a compelling state interest. This was looked at very carefully. And whatever the regulation was had to be very narrowly tailored to what that interest was. On the other hand, if the regulation or statute and interest involved a property or economics right, if that's what it would interfered with, the court said only minimum scrutiny. So the court almost in all cases just deferred and said, in essence, we accept whatever the state or federal government is saying is the reason for the law. I think that was a giant mistake. I think it was a horrible idea. I think that's the primary reason we're in this situation, why economic and property rights are not very well protected in the United States. That's to blame what happened in 1937 and in essence in 38, if you can believe it, in a footnote in a case called the Caroline Products. But that's a different discussion. That's what happened. And so they didn't lay out exactly how courts were supposed to analyze Second Amendment cases, but they said the regulation in Washington, D.C. doesn't survive under any level of scrutiny. So in other words, they said whether strict scrutiny applies, minimum scrutiny applies, or something new that was arising at the time called an intermediate level of scrutiny, under any standard, the D.C. ordinance fails, it's unconstitutional. So they left us with sort of an unclear picture on exactly how this newly defined right to keep and bear arms, an individual's right to keep and bear arms, was gonna be analyzed by the lower courts. Next thing that happens is we get the McDonald case, which is somewhat unremarkable, but actually important because in that case, the Supreme Court determined that the Second Amendment actually applied to the states. This is very important without getting into too much detail here. Remember, the Bill of Rights doesn't automatically apply 
to the states. It restrains the federal government. It wasn't until the 14th Amendment that we got what we call the Doctrine of Incorporation. This happened one right at a time where the courts would say, okay, here's a right in the Bill of Rights. This now applies to the states as well. That happened in the McDonald case. So now there is no argument that the Second Amendment doesn't just restrain the federal government. It also restrains the state governments as well. That was the right ruling there. So fast forward to 2022. We get the Bruin case. This is a big, big case for Second Amendment people and really for people who are anti-gun as well. Because after Heller, and what the courts were doing, by the way, was they sort of settled on this intermediate level of scrutiny. And that's how courts had proceeded analyzing Second Amendment cases. So we get to the Bruin case. And the argument now is that, well, Heller only said that people can have firearms for self-defense inside the home. Yeah, there's an individual right, but it only applies inside the home. It doesn't apply outside the home. So what happens in the Bruin case is the city of New York, as a routine matter, says, yeah, sure, you can get a permit to carry your firearm out outside the home, but just because you want to defend yourself outside the home, that's not a good enough reason. You got to show some reason outside the norm, a special reason to get a permit to carry your firearm outside the home. There were many states that took this position. We call them may issue states. What that meant is if you apply for a permit, they may or may not issue the permit. And pretty much in all cases, they didn't issue the permit. These states all took a wholesale position saying, look, if all you're saying is you want to defend yourself outside the home, sorry, no permit for you. So the question arose, does the Second Amendment actually apply outside the home? Well, this seemed like a no-brainer to me, right? Because it's not just the right to keep arms. It's also the right to bear arms, and every word makes a difference. By this time in 2022, the court had changed. We had a very conservative court, and to nobody's surprise, I don't think, the court said, yeah, keep and bear arms actually means keep, and bear them outside the home. And so in 6-3 decision, Justice Thomas authors the decision now. They say, yes, this idea that your constitutional right to carry a firearm outside the home. This can't be subject to the whim of some bureaucrat. They have to issue that permit. They can still have a permit. They can require a permit. Not all states do. Arizona, where I am, does not require a permit to carry your firearm outside the home. But states are allowed to have permits. They just can't deny them because they feel like it. They can have restrictions. The court didn't detail exactly what those restrictions were, and there's some litigation about that. They also left the door open about what they called sensitive places. They said there were some places guns can be banned. So the court identified certain sensitive places as government buildings, polling places, schools, courthouses, places like that. But they were very clear in that case to say that, look, you can't just declare the whole city a sensitive place. This, of course, is ongoing litigation right now because many of the anti-gun states have tried to do exactly that. They've simply said, well, everywhere is a sensitive place, parks, public transportations, virtually every piece of public property. Okay, that's pending litigation. By the way, I feel very confident that the court is going to strike down these very overreaching efforts to declare virtually entire cities or states as sensitive places. But put that on hold, that'll be a video for another day. But you know, when this case was decided, everybody was sort of focused on what the case was about, which was that the Second Amendment doesn't just apply in the home, it applies outside the home as well. That was sort of seen as the major holding. When I looked at this case, and I think lots of uh, constitutional scholars and law professors looked at this and we said, huh, they did something else that seems very, very big here. They changed and laid down exactly what the rule is going to be for courts to analyze Second Amendment cases. And while this is a bit of an oversimplification, what they said is that whole level of scrutiny thing, that's out the door. We're not going to perform any level of scrutiny. What I wish they had done was said Second Amendment cases, like other important fundamental constitutional rights, should be subject to strict scrutiny analysis. That's what they should have done, in my opinion. That's not what they did. They threw out the scrutiny 
analysis completely. They said, we don't even do that. Now, if something is part of the right to keep and bear arms, what they did instead was now say, look to that restriction on Second Amendment rights and ask one question. Is that restriction consistent with the historical tradition of firearms regulation? So they announced a new standard. They said, look, if this particular restriction on Second Amendment rights is something that existed earlier in our history, and I say it early in our history because they didn't really specify exactly what time period we're looking at, but most people now look and try to make the case that at the time the Second Amendment was adopted, that's the relevant period of history for our tradition. If there is an analog, it doesn't have to be exactly the same restriction, but something close to what this particular restriction is that's being analyzed, if there's something pretty close, then, and only then, will it be constitutional. So in other words, now we're in a historical analysis. That's what the Supreme Court did in the Bruin case. They said, from here forthwith, we will now analyze all restrictions on Second Amendment rights to figure out if that restriction is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulations. If it is, then it passes constitutional muster. And if it doesn't, it's not consistent with the Second Amendment and it's unconstitutional. So I'm sure as the Supreme Court justices were talking about this case, the question came up about exactly what is consistent with the historical tradition in our country of regulating firearms? And probably the question arose about whether or not laws that restrict people who are convicted felons, if those laws are consistent with the nation's historical traditions of firearms regulations. Okay, I'm gonna read you a quote directly from the case here. This comes from Justice Kavanaugh. He quoted Justice Scalia's majority opinion back in Heller, and he reiterated an important point. Here's what he said. He quoted from the majority opinion in Heller. He said, quote, Nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons. He also mentioned mentally ill and laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools, government buildings, and laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. He didn't go further to point to any historical tradition of regulating these things, he just reiterated in the Bruin case something Justice Scalia said in the Heller case that, hey, you can still tell people who are convicted of felony offenses, no guns for you. We call that a prohibited possessor under federal law. I can think of a whole bunch of different restrictions on the Second Amendment that probably aren't consistent with our nation's historical tradition because I can't find any old cases, old evidence of restrictions in this particular area. We've had litigation now in many different areas. For example, federal law currently prohibits people who are convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence offenses. But we have cases now working through the system where courts have found, you know what, I can't find a regulation consistent with our nation's historical traditions that say people who are convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors can be banned from having guns. This is an open question now. In addition, People who have temporary restraining orders granted against them in domestic violence situations, it's very common for a judge in a restraining order matter to say, no guns for you. Well, this has now been challenged successfully. In fact, the Supreme Court has recently accepted cert, which means they're gonna hear a case on this very question. Stand by for United States versus Rahimi, where the Supreme Court is going to answer the question now. It's going to be very interesting because I don't think they're going to find a historical precedent in our nation's history somewhere that says 
You know, when there's a temporary restraining order granted in a domestic violence situation, we can tell the person the order is granted against that they can't have firearms. So we'll see what the Supreme Court is going to do with this issue. Other questions have arisen. What about people who are just charged with felony offenses? It's very common in both the state court and the federal courts across the nation that if you're charged with a felony offense, not convicted, charged, which means you're presumed innocent, courts often enter orders, release conditions that say no guns for you. Okay, good luck finding a historical precedent in our nation's history that says there can be such a rule. And indeed, courts are now finding that there are problems with this. This violates the Second Amendment. These are the kinds of cases that are now bubbling up through our justice system. Prohibitions under federal law against marijuana users, prohibitions that say, hey, if you smoke marijuana, you can't have a firearm. These have also been under attack in the courts successfully. Restrictions on firearms that have serial number problems. Yeah, you probably didn't even know about this one. Firearms have serial numbers on them. If yours is obliterated, you can't read it. Okay, that's a federal crime to be in possession of such a weapon. Of course, good luck finding a historical precedent for that, and courts have said as much. So this also is something working through our system right now. Same for ghost guns. And ghost guns didn't even exist hundreds of years ago. So good luck finding a historical precedent that says having a ghost gun or a gun that maybe is printed by a 3D printer, a manufactured firearm, restrictions against that also, some courts are now finding violate the Second Amendment. In a case I want to talk about, the Third Circuit has said, if you have a felony conviction on your record and you are now a prohibited possessor under federal law, we can't find any historical precedent here. Therefore, the federal law that bans people who are convicted of not just federal felonies, but crimes that subject people to more than one year in prison. Even if you don't do the one year, if you are at risk of more than a year in prison and you have been convicted of that crime, you can be considered a prohibited possessor under federal law. Of course, if your crime is a federal felony, there is no way to fix this currently under federal law. That is a lifetime prohibition on your Second Amendment rights if you're convicted of a felony in the federal court. So in a very interesting case, Range versus Attorney General, that literally was decided shortly before we're filming this video, back in June 6th of 2023, the Third Circuit said exactly that. They declared the federal Felon in Possession Law, 18 United States Code 922 Section G. That contains many restrictions on firearms, especially the prohibited possessor section. Third Circuit just declared that unconstitutional. What they said is the government, because remember the government has the burden here to justify the regulation by showing that regulation on Second Amendment rights is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation. Third Circuit said they didn't carry that burden of proof. Mr. Range, of course, had a really, what I'd call, ridiculous little misdemeanor conviction. It was back in 1995. The guy made a false statement so he could collect food stamps under state law. Why is this affected? Well, because under state law in Pennsylvania, where the range case comes from, he was at risk of five years in prison. And because of that risk, even though Mr. Range didn't serve any time in prison, he got probation, that subjected him to that federal felon in possession law. And it rendered him a prohibited possessor under federal law. And Mr. Range was denied a firearm when he went to buy one and the background check was conducted. He was denied and Mr. Range brought a case to challenge under the new Bruin standard, the federal felon in possession standard. Mr. Range decided to challenge the federal felon in possession statute saying, hey, I can't find any regulation consistent with our nation's 
history and tradition of firearms regulation. Therefore, declare it to be unconstitutional. So Third Circuit applied Bruin. First they found that yes, telling somebody that they can't have a firearm, that fits within the heartland of the right that the Second Amendment protects. They talked a little bit about what the words the people that are protected in the Second Amendment means and they decided, I think very consistently with other cases, that the people, as referred to in the Second Amendment, includes all the people, not just people who don't have convictions on their record. Think about what that would mean because the Fourth Amendment, for example, protects the right of the people not to be subjected to unreasonable searches and seizures. So if you're gonna say the people in the Second Amendment doesn't include people who have felony convictions, that would mean the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect them as well. Same with the people in the First Amendment. It makes no sense. And they made the right finding, in my opinion, in the Third Circuit. They said Mr. Range is part of the people, even with his conviction, that are protected by the Second Amendment. Then they did exactly what the Bruin court suggested they do. They did a historical analysis to see, did we have laws that said people who are convicted of criminal offenses should be deprived of their right to keep and bear arms. They couldn't find any. Very interesting what they talked about in that case. And I really suggest people read this case because it was a very interesting case to read. They went through the current federal prohibited possessor statute. And what they found was it wasn't until 1938 that we even had a federal statute on the books saying that if you have a felony conviction, you can be deprived of the right to keep and bear arms. And that only applied to violent felons, not all felons. And it wasn't until 1961 that the federal felon in possession statute applied to all felons. And of course, this would apply to Mr. Range, who had a misdemeanor conviction that subjected him to five years in prison, more than the one year described in the federal possession statute, rendering him a prohibited possessor. So anyways, they said, look, 1961, 1938, way too modern to be considered consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation. The government can't carry their burden. Now, to be fair, in the Range case, the Third Circuit limited that case just to Mr. Range, but the reasoning still holds true, and I think this is gonna be a very big issue going forward. What I thought most fascinating about the case, besides the holding, right, because think about this holding, because there isn't a historical argument to ban people who are convicted of crimes, I think the federal felon in possession statute is going to have to fall under the Bruin analysis. But how do we square this with the statements in both Heller and in Bruin where they said nothing in our decision affects essentially the prohibited possessor statute? They made that claim, but they didn't apply the analysis they laid out in Bruin to that conclusion. They didn't tell the courts how you get there with the new analysis about the nation's historical tradition of regulating firearms. The two things don't go together. I think the most fascinating part of the case was a concurring opinion by Judge Porter. Cheers to this judge. Excellent opinion. It's a concurring opinion, so he's really speaking for himself here, not the majority in the case. But what he said was really powerful. He basically said in the case, Congress has no power to disarm anybody. They simply don't have that power. Now you might be scratching your head and saying, what? Are you telling me the Congress of the United States has no power to pass a law to say we can deprive people of their right to keep and bear arms? Yup, that's what Judge Porter said, and I think he got it right. Why do I think he's got that right? Because Congress's powers are specifically listed in Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. And you will not find the power to regulate firearms in there. How do they get this power? Okay, they get this power because of back to 1937, very bad year in our constitutional history. Because not only did we get this level of scrutiny thing changed, as I talked about, that's where they birthed this idea of levels of scrutiny. They also changed our Commerce Clause jurisdiction. And that's how we get these regulations, right? 
That's really the source of power for the federal government on so many things, from gun regulations to the drug war to regulating civil rights litigation to so many other things that Congress does. They hang it on this one power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, why did the framers of the Constitution put this in there? Because what they meant when they said regulate interstate commerce, they wanted to have a free trade zone within the United States or the 13 states at the time. They didn't want states erecting tariffs against other states. That's what they meant to regulate interstate commerce, to make sure it was working properly, not to drop tons of regulations on every conceivable thing that touches Congress in any conceivable way, which is basically how our Commerce Clause jurisdiction is today. And by the way, if you're listening to this video, it's one of my issues that I raise as often as possible in court. Our Commerce Clause jurisprudence is completely out of control. I believe the framers of the Congress Constitution would be absolutely shocked if they knew how our courts have interpreted the Commerce Clause. It was supposed to be a very limited and specific power of Congress has turned into an almost unlimited source of jurisdiction for Congress to do virtually anything it wants. If you're not aware of this issue, I'm glad I just made you aware of it. You should be keen towards cases that challenge this question. I think the Supreme Court right now has a makeup that might be ripe for presenting Commerce Clause cases and saying, hey, we need to cut back very substantially on federal Commerce Clause jurisdiction. It's essentially how we get this huge federal criminal justice system, something that was not contemplated by either our founding fathers or the framers of the Constitution. You know, Judge Porter also made some very interesting claims as well. He I think called into question this entire Bruin scheme of looking at the historical tradition. Why does he say this doesn't make sense? Well, the reason he says it doesn't make sense is because the Second Amendment had nothing to do with state laws at the time. In the time period we're looking at when the Second Amendment was adopted, it didn't even apply to the states. The states were free to regulate guns and gun issues and ammunition under the state powers, we call them the police powers, with no regard to the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment didn't apply to the states. So we are looking at a time period of state laws dealing with guns that have nothing to do with the Second Amendment to try to understand the scope of what the Second Amendment means. Judge Porter points out, this doesn't make any sense at all. But that's where we are right now with Second Amendment jurisprudence. I wanna close with a statement from another concurring opinion in the Range case. This was authored by Judge Ambrose, and I hope you look at this decision, not just the Range case, but look at the, at least the two concurring opinions. The one I just talked about, written by Judge Porter. I think that one was very astute, made some excellent points about just the structure of our Constitution and why I think he agrees with me that this test under Bruin that the Supreme Court has fashioned really doesn't make any sense. But the other concurring opinion by Judge Ambrose, here's what Judge Ambrose says. Judge Ambrose observes the Supreme Court has repeatedly, both in the Heller case and in the Bruin case, affirmed these felon in possession laws, the very laws I've been talking about in this case that the Third Circuit just struck down. This is what the judge says, quote, I close with the observation that the Supreme Court will have to square its history-driven test with its concurrent view that felon gun restrictions are presumptively lawful, end quote. What the judge is saying here is, look, you said it, in Heller and in Bruin that these prohibited possessor laws, look, we're not affecting that, those are still fine. But she didn't tell us why, because when we employ the historical tradition test that you just laid out in Bruin, we can't find anything earlier than 1938, and that only applies to violent felons. So tell us how we square that test with the prohibited possessor laws that are currently on the books 
under federal law? I think it's going to be a hard question. It'll be very interesting to see. Either the Supreme Court, in my opinion, is going to have to back off its test in the Bruin and change that test around a little bit, or they're going to have to back off their statement about people who are convicted felons being subject to these laws that say you can't have a firearm anymore. Because I don't think they can square the test with the prohibited possessor laws. Let me just wrap up with just a couple of personal observations here. First off, I want to say that, yes, I do support the right to keep and bear arms. I think competent, responsible adults who know what they're doing, which means they can safely handle and store and use a firearm without being a substantial risk to another person or their property, should be able to bear arms inside or outside their home, right? We're all safer when competent, responsible adults bear firearms. This is how you stop bad guys with guns. I know it's almost become cliche, but it's true. That's how you stop a crazy person with a firearm by a sane, responsible, competent person with a firearm. Whether that's a police officer who shows up maybe several minutes later, and you can't blame the police for that, they can't be everywhere, or it's a person who's on scene, who has a firearm, we're all safer when competent, responsible people have firearms. So I support that, no question. But this test that the Supreme Court came up with in the Bruin case makes no sense, right? What they should have done here is said, the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, we're going to apply the same test we apply in the First Amendment context and in the Equal Protections Clause context and many other contexts where a fundamental constitutional right is at issue. Let's look at the restriction. If the restriction impairs that right, the right to keep and bear arms, the person or the government entity acting, whether it's the state or the federal government, should have to show a compelling state interest and justify this so it can withstand a strict scrutiny analysis. And even if they do, the law can't be overbroad. It has to be as narrowly tailored as possible, right tight to that compelling interest. Yes, do I think people who have violent felonies in their past should be prohibited from keeping and bearing arms, yes. The burden should be on them unless they can come into court and say, look, I no longer am a risk. They should have that opportunity to come in and convince a judge that even though they have a violent felony in their past, they no longer are such a risk. And if they can convince a judge of that, they should get their Second Amendment rights back. But to leave us in a position now with the test on the table under the Bruin case essentially says we can't even deprive people who have violent felonies in their background in our present dangers with firearms. We can't tell such people that they can't have guns seems to make no sense under the current state of the law. Now look, I talk to the gun crowd all the time. I know some of you take the position, it's absolute. It says shall not be infringed. Like, I get that. That's not what it means. No right is absolute. And if you think that that's the case, think about the person who is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison and says, you know, I think I'd like to take my AR-15 with me to prison. Do you want that person to take their AR-15 to prison? What if they say, look, I like to shoot guards and I want to take my AR-15 with me? Well, if you agree with me that that person shouldn't be able to take their firearm with them to prison, then you agree with me that there are limitations upon the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Do you want to tell a four-year-old you can't have an AR-15? I do. And if you do, that means you recognize some restrictions. Okay, I think there's a reasonable course to chart here. And the test really should be, are you a competent adult? Do you have the mental capacity and the technical capacity to keep and bear arms in a way that does not present risks to other people? If you do, you should be allowed to have the weapon. If you do present a risk to other people, well, then you shouldn't have the weapon. And people who are in such a category should be able to request a hearing in front of the judge. Maybe they did at one time present a risk, but maybe they're now rehabilitated. They've grown up. They're mature. They no longer present such a risk. They should be entitled to a hearing. We shouldn't restrict people ever permanently from 
their Second Amendment rights. Okay, that's my two cents take on it. That's my little overview of what's going on in the gun world. Stand by, because there's lots more interesting cases coming up in Second Amendment jurisprudence, and as they develop, we'll be running them down right here, putting videos out there. Okay, so just to wrap up, my name is Mark Victor. I'm the owner of the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm. We represent people throughout the nation. Most of what I do is criminal law. I've been representing people for almost 30 years now. In major felony cases, we have a national practice. If you're interested in consulting with us, give the law firm a call. We're easy to find. Attorneys for Freedom. Attorneys for Freedom isn't just a catchy name. It describes our attitude about freedom. We're not just pro-gun. We're pro-freedom on every issue. So if you like this video, like, subscribe, leave a comment. If you hate this video, leave a comment. If it's a civilized comment, if it's a reasonable, rational comment, you will get a response, no problem. You wanna to speak to me directly? Just email me directly. I am an attorney who is very easy to get a hold of. My email is mark, M-A-R-C, at attorneys for freedom. Com. If you bring an uncivilized comment, don't be surprised if you don't get a response back. But if you bring a civilized comment, agree or disagree, happy to hear from you. By the way, especially happy to hear from you if you disagree. No problem. Reasonable minds can disagree. Thanks for checking out my video and hearing my thoughts on Second Amendment and the current cases that are rising up through our system. All right, everybody, have an awesome day. Peace. I'm out.